the purpose of life is life itself. More life, better life, healthier life, longer life. Uh, this is ridiculous that the purpose of life could ever be death. That is like saying the purpose of uh, marriage is uh, divorce. Uh, 15 years ago that I really got interested into longevity. And several reasons account for that. One, obviously, I was starting to age and to feel the pains of aging. Uh, two, uh, that uh, there was the Nobel Prize by Shinya Yamanaka in the year 2012 um, for uh, showing that aging is flexible, uh, that aging can be reversed. Welcome to the Buying Time podcast, where we talk about longevity, science, and future tech. Today we have Jose Cordero. Jose is a master of longevity. He knows everyone in the scene. Uh, he's connected in every place and every nook and cranny. He's actually brilliant. He has a master's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT. And what we're going to be talking about today is his book, The Death of Death. Welcome, Jose. Well, thank you so much, Liz. It is great to be with you and with Sar to talk about the most important question for the whole planet, for humanity, which is how to stop and how to reverse aging. This is such an interesting topic uh, uh, to tell you, Jose. I was, Liz, I was telling Jose as to how um, he has been drinking from the fountain of longevity movement. He has been interacting with, like yourself, everyone who has made a name for themselves in that, all thought leaders, including uh, one of my heroes, Ray Kurzweil. And uh, we are going to get into that a little later. Liz, on to you. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait for that. You know, Jose, I've known you for actually quite a while. And, but what I've never done is asked you how you got started. How did you get started in this area? What, what, what made you think that this is something that you wanted to write about and speak about? Well, as a futurist, I have always looked to technologies and trends for the future. Uh, but it was not until about... Uh, uh, 15 years ago that I really got interested into longevity and several reasons account for that. One, obviously, I was starting to age and to feel the pains of aging. Uh, two, uh, that uh, there was the Nobel Prize by Shinya Yamanaka in the year 2012 um, for uh, showing that aging is flexible, uh, that aging can be reversed. To me, this is one of the most incredible scientific discoveries in history. And then also, sadly, that my father died after that. And um, death is horrible, it's terrible, especially of someone that you love so much, like a family member. And so when my father died, I said, well, we have to do something. This is time. Now we know that aging can be reversed. And uh, it is the time to begin working on this. So basically, I switch careers. I switch everything I was doing. And I am now devoting myself completely to longevity, to health, to reversing aging and stopping death. So this one moment in science, basically, where uh, Dr. Yamanaka takes cells that are old, reprograms them, and shows that they can become young, this is like your moment. Um, well, actually, maybe the death of my father is, is, is equally important to me. But uh, scientifically, there is no doubt Shinya Yamanaka's discovery uh, is incredible. And the sad thing is that more, most people don't know about it. If you talk about people in the street, they don't know that aging can be reversed. And something even worse, they don't know that cancer cells discover immortality. Cancer cells are biologically immortal. And we discovered that a long, long time ago, since 1951, when a patient called Henrietta Lacks died because of a cancer, uh, we know that cancer cells do not age. Cancer cells are called biologically immortal because they do not age. 
And I repeat, we know this since 1951. And if you go out in the street and you ask people, well, do you know that cancer is immortal? People don't know it unless they have had a cancer themselves and they discover that if you leave one single cancer cell, it grows again, it reproduces, and cancer cells do not age. That is why cancer cells are biologically immortal. Uh, and to me, this is also key. People need to know uh, that cancer discovered uh, immortality and cancer cells did not go to university. So people like you, Liz, Sar, me, who have gone to university, we are going to discover what cancer did. So I believe we are very close, not only to curing cancer in the next five to 10 years, but also to slow down aging and then reverse aging. And Henrietta Lacks cells are still alive to this day. They are still used for research. They literally are immortal. They have gone on and on. Uh, yes, talking a, a little bit more about the HeLa cells, because it was Henrietta Lacks that originated these cells that are the most well-used and well-known cells in biology. Um, they have been alive since uh, 1920, when Henrietta Lacks uh, was born, and she died in 1951. So if you really look at how all these cells are, or some of them, they are 102 years old by now. They are centenarian cells, but they behave like teenagers, uh, growing, reproducing, uh, having fun. This is what cancer discovered, immortality, how to stop aging. Of course, cancer is a thing that, you know, we have to stop cells from growing erratically out of control and harness the ability for them to live a long time without causing human disease. And um, and so that that is also a focus. Tell us a little bit about your book. Um, well, finishing up with what you said, which is so important. Uh, yes, we have a lot to learn from cancer, but we also have to learn from other good cells that don't age, like the germ cells, you yeah. and I, and all multicellular organisms. We have two kinds of cells. The most important ones, which are the germ cells for reproductions, they do not age also. They are biologically immortal. This is how they are called, biologically immortal. And then we have the somatic cells um, for the body. Soma means body in Greek. Somatic cells do age. So uh, the most important cells for the continuation of a species are germ cells, and they do not age. But not only these type of cells, the best one, germ cells, or the worst one, cancer cells, do not age. Um, there are also some small organisms, like we know some hydras, jellyfish, that are biologically immortal. So there is also already immortality in nature. And even if we go back, back, back into the past of uh, life on Earth, the first life forms on the on the planet, which are bacteria that divide symmetrically, symmetrically and that have round chromosomes with no beginning and no end, and therefore they don't have telomeres at the end, they are also considered biologically immortal. And this is very important to understand. Life appeared to live. The purpose of life is life itself. More life, better life, healthier life, longer life. The purpose of life is not death, as some people say. Uh, this is ridiculous that the purpose of life could ever be death. That is like saying the purpose of uh, marriage is uh, divorce or vice versa, that the purpose of divorce is to get married and get divorced anyway. So uh, going back to biology, basic biology, uh, uh, immortality already exists. There are immortal cells, there are immortal bacteria, there are immortal organisms. And this is what I try to explain. Immortality already exists. So the proof that it is possible is that it already exists. These are the ideas I try to talk about in my book. I have a fantastic co-author who is uh, David Wood. He is uh, British and he, he is um, the co-founder of Symbian. If you ever had a Nokia telephone, 
In the past, Nokia telephones had the first intelligent operating system, which is Symbian. So my co-author, David, he, he co-invented the system. And uh, five years ago, we decided to write a book. He was also writing about longevity, and I was too. And I said, okay, let's team up together and write the most revolutionary book in history, which is The Death of Death. And my book now is in a dozen languages. Originally, it came out in, um, uh, in Spanish, my mother tongue. And actually, the book has a prologue by Aubrey de Grey. And then it has uh, many quotes by famous people like Liz Parrish, uh, George George, the famous biologist at Harvard, also the famous physicist at um, New York, Michio Kaku. Michio Kaku, who is fantastic. He also believes in immortality. And uh, also my dear friend, Ray Kurzweil, who is an engineer from my alma mater from MIT. Uh, anyway, so my book has been coming out in many, many languages. Uh, in Spanish here, uh, this is German. In German, they change a little bit the title. In German, it's called The Victory Over Death. The Victory Over Death. Uh, in other languages, the title also has been modified, like in Chinese. In Chinese, it's called Eternal Life, which is also a good title, Eternal Life, because they don't like to use the word death in Chinese. So basically, it is Eternal Life. And in Russian, they also changed the title. In Russian, it is called Death Must Die. Very Russian style, Death must die so i'm really proud and now it's coming out in english published by the very prestigious uh publisher springer nature springer um also publishes um and books for the mass public for everybody uh, under the trademark copernicus because copernicus was a very famous scientist and so my book is just coming out in english with some incredible quotes uh, not only by Liz Parrish, Ray Kurzweil, George George, Michio Kaku, the prologue by uh, Aubrey de Grey, and the epilogue by another uh, great friend who is Alex Shavoronkov. Alex Shavoronkov has one of the biggest uh, companies working on artificial intelligence for rejuvenation. Uh, his company, In Silico Medicine, is based in Hong Kong. And he's doing a lot of visionary work in, uh, in Hong Kong, in mainland China, and also in the Arab countries. Uh, he's working uh, in uh, the United Arab Emirates, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and many, many other places. So I am happy that rejuvenation technologies are beginning to spread around the world. And there are more and more scientists, more and more companies. Uh, even like we all know, BioViva, which is an incredible company that has pioneered gene therapy for rejuvenation in the world. Thank you. Sar, I bet you have a few questions. Yeah, definitely. He's, uh, he's, he's given so many interesting things. First thing first, Jose, uh, when is your English uh, edition coming up? When is it getting published? Yes, um, it's coming um, right now while we talk. Basically, the book is being printed, so it will be out um, in the next uh, few weeks. Probably end of beginning of July sometime, July 2023. Yes, uh, uh, my, target, my target is July 14th because that is French Revolution, uh, Bastille Day. And this is a revolution, but this is a bigger revolution than the French Revolution or the American Revolution. Than any revolution that we ever ever saw. Any revolution that we ever saw in the history, there's a bigger revolution than that. Hey, what can I, what can we do? You know, you are talking about this book getting out in so many different languages. And I know that uh, a country like India, it's got about 1.4 billion people of which hardly about 125 million people can speak English, but not all of them can speak very fluent English. More than about 1.3 billion people cannot speak English. What can we do to get the knowledge of this to those uh, population? Well, um, I am translating the book in as many languages as possible. 
uh, as I said, I have a dozen uh, languages now, dozen editions. And um, of course, I want to get into India because India actually truly is one of my favorite places. I have gone four times to do meditation in Rishikesh and I have traveled all over India uh, with an Air India Pass. I have gone uh, from the north uh, to the south. I have been in Chennai. I have been in Bangalore. I have been in Mumbai, um, in about uh, 25 uh, cities. But I like for meditation uh, Rishikesh. It's a beautiful place. It's unique because uh, I always remember when the Ganges River comes from the Himalaya mountains and get into the Indian plateau. And, and also because meditation, transcendental meditation and yoga uh, were in a way originated in that area, in Rishikesh. So yes, I want to publish my book in Hindi, in Tamil, in uh, Bengali, in all big languages of India. And maybe with your help, uh, we can do that. Sorry. We would we would love to do that. We would love to do that, Jose. We would like, uh, you know, uh, it's always an injustice that somebody who cannot speak English is being left behind from all this revolution. We would love to do it. And let me tell you, I'm publishing my book in uh, small languages compared to Indian languages. In fact, also in two weeks, my book comes out in Bulgarian. And, you know, you would say, oh, Bulgarian, that's a small language. And it is, you know, there are only about 10 million people in Bulgaria. So it, it is a small country. But I am also working on other small languages like Greek, Czech, Hebrew, and of course, big languages. Also next year, it's coming out in Arabic. Arabic is a, is the, uh, it's a major uh, global language as well spoken by uh, over 400 million people. So it is important to me, as well as I said, Bengali, Hindi, Tamil, all the languages of India. We are going to be offering our services in 10 different languages in India, which have got substantial population. We'll make sure that your book is available in all those languages. People need to know what these are instead of thinking that this is some kind of a magic that happens in some faraway land. You talked about so many uh, people whose name uh, I could immediately connect with. Aubrey D. Gray to start with. He was our guest a couple of weeks ago. I remember um, he's one person who started this quite early and a lot of people were calling him charlatan. And suddenly now he's become a pioneer. Uh, off off the camera when we were talking about it, he mentioned about it. He was saying, I would love to talk, you know, uh, get to see, get to see, get get to hear more about it. Yes, actually, uh, since I studied at, at MIT, I religiously, and I'm not very religious. I think I'm more spiritual, uh, but not religious in the traditional sense. Um, I read a MIT Technology Review, which I think is the best technology magazine in the planet. And uh, in 2005. They called Aubrey the Grey a charlatan, that what he was saying was impossible, uh, that it would never happen. And so actually he retaliated and he made a bet, a bet against any scientist who could prove that it was impossible, that he was a charlatan. And of course, uh, no one could win the bet. Uh, and that was important. He was in the front cover of MIT Technology Review in 2005. But what is more interesting is that in 2019, that is 14 years after he was called a charlatan, uh, MIT Technology Review came with another issue. And in the front cover, it says, old age is over if you want it. And basically, MIT Technology Review recognized that we are very close to rejuvenation technology and that this is not impossible and that in fact it is just a matter of time until we are able to rejuvenate human beings. So this is a paradigm change uh, even in a top scientific publication like MIT Technology Review in a very short time period, uh, 14 years. Also many things influenced that change of view like uh, Shinya Yamanaka discovering that um, um, uh, aging is flexible and that aging can be accelerated, that no one wants that, right? Aging can be stopped, but better, aging can be reversed. 
And there are many Spanish scientists working in this, many, many, uh, which is kind of interesting because we have a major cancer cell uh, center in Spain that have done pioneering uh, work on cancer research. And uh, Liz Parrish knows about these people in Spain, but also some other people working on um, Yamanaka factors. When um, Jeff Bezos began with his new companies and other billionaires, he's not the only one, Altos Labs, Altos Labs, because it is located in Altos, Silicon Valley, California, he recruited originally 25 scientists, out of which five are Spanish. This is truly incredible. Uh, five scientists out of 25 are Spanish. So Spain was the second country in terms of a nationality after um, U.S. citizens. And that is because there is a lot of interest in Spain. And also on the bad side is because Spain is aging very fast and it has the second oldest population in the world among major countries, only after Japan. Japan has an average life expectancy today of about 85 years, and Spain is very close behind with 84 and a half years of average life expectancy today. So for Spain, just as for Japan, where Shinja Jamanaka lives, uh, this is a key factor, a priority. We are all aging, we are all dying, but the good news is we are very close to stop aging and to reverse aging. Now, Richard Dawkins said that the gene is immortal. It uses us to stay alive forever. I, the, the, the strength of science now is to harness the human body to uh, control the genes. Absolutely. Um, that is why the germ cells, uh, which are the important ones for the reproduction of the genes forever and ever, are biologically immortal. Germ cells in our bodies, they do not age. It is the somatic cells, which is the rest of the body, who ages. But we are not that important for the genes, as you said, for the germ cells, because we are like the support for them into immortality. But now we know we can also change that. We can be like the immortal jellyfish or some immortal hydras, and we can stop aging in our complete body, not just on the germ cells. You're a good friend of Ray Kurzweil's, and while I was in Spain traveling with you, you have a copy, a pre-copy of his next book. Can you review it? Can you say anything about it? Yes, yes, because I'm so excited. Uh, he sent me his new book that you can see. The Singularity is nearer, nearer. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, next year, this is coming out next year. This is um, the book to review, to make some comments, additions, corrections, etc. Let me give you the, the story behind. I have known Ray for uh, almost four decades uh, because he is also from MIT from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And his thesis advisor was, one of, was also one of my favorite professors at MIT, Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky is considered one of the three fathers of artificial intelligence. Marvin Minsky led the, and created basically uh, the Center for Artificial Intelligence at MIT, where Ray Kurzweil studied and where I studied years later. Anyway, so I have known Ray for a long time and we have had many common friends at MIT and elsewhere. So I have been uh, also with him when he founded Singularity University in the year 2009. I was one of the first faculty members, the first professors at Singularity University. And I stayed there for uh, four years, five years in Silicon Valley before I moved to Spain. Right now, I live in Madrid, Spain. But going back to the book, in the year 2005, he published uh, the first book with that name. He has published actually like also 10 books, but um, he's known for um, um, some previous books from last century, last millennium, like The Age of Intelligent Machines. And then he wrote The Age of Spiritual Machines. And now he has written The uh, the Singularity is Near in 2005, 
And in 2024, almost 20 years later, 19 years to be exact, his publishing The Singularity is nearer. He has been making forecasts for almost half a century, and he has been 83% correct. Actually, I helped him reviewing his predictions that you can see in Wikipedia. Uh, and he is about 83% correct. This is truly incredible. And these are scientific predictions. This is not Nostradamus or Rasputin. This is science and technology thanks to the advances of exponential technologies. And uh, he has made many things that have already come to be. Like when good... Uh, uh, a robot, artificial intelligence, beat humans in chess. When they could beat humans in Jeopardy, the very famous TV show uh, in the USA, etc., etc., etc. And actually, he has been wrong in those. But for being too late on his predictions, for being too conservative. And uh, for example, he said that uh, a computer could beat humans on chess in the year 1999. And it happened in 1997, two years before he predicted it. And the same with, with a computer. Uh, well, that computer was IBM Deep Blue, Deep Blue by IBM in 1997. And then IBM made another computer called Watson. And Watson beat humans on TV on um, this knowledge game called Geopardy also two years before he predicted. So yeah, he has been wrong, but because, because he's too conservative and he gives some time extra just in case. In any event, many, many predictions are still going to happen according to him. You can check them in his books, especially The Age of the Spiritual Machines, which is from 1998, okay? So these are not even from his book, The Singularity is Near, no. His major predictions are from 1998 and before in the book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. Anyway, let me come back to uh, two of the most important predictions uh, that are here again. And he says the dates are the same. They have not moved. They have not gone uh, forward into the future or closer to the present. Uh, they are 2029 and 2045. And I will tell you what you will read in the book, The Singularity is Nearer. He still maintains, after decades, that we will reach longevity escape velocity by 2029. That means, that means if we make it to 2030, if we leave that one year, critical year between 2029 and 2030, we will reach longevity escape velocity. That basically means we will live long enough to live forever because uh, life expectancy keeps on increasing. It is increasing every year we survive, we get more extra life because of the advances in science and technology. Anyway, so by the year 2030, we will get one extra year per year we survive. That means uh, we will be getting an extra year, an extra year, and even more, but aging, still aging, until 2045. In 2045, we will have rejuvenation technologies for everybody. And I actually think that this might be sooner. If we actually push this movement and we publish in Indian languages, Sar, with your help, if we publish this all over the planet so that people know that this is Ria, this is science, and we are very close. Uh, I actually like to say we are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. So where do you want to be? Do you want to be one of the last unlucky people who die or one of the first people that will live long enough to live forever? So we are very close. So those are the two dates. I will repeat, uh, 2029 to 2013, we will reach longevity escape velocity that also sometimes is called the Methuselarity, the singularity of Methuselah, the singularity of Methuselah. And in 2045, we will reach immortality through 
biological rejuvenation, which is important. Rejuvenation. So it doesn't matter if we are 70, if we are 80, even if we are 90 years old by 2045, because we will have rejuvenation technologies. We will apply what we know today scientific, scientifically, like epigenomics, that we can reverse the aging process. We can reverse the age of the cells. And also we have proven now that we can reverse the age of different organs. It has been proven finally that we can also reverse the age of organs. And very soon we are going to begin working with whole organisms, not just cells, tissues, and organs, but complete organisms. This is being done now. Two more things about those two dates, um, because he's basically a computer scientist, first of all, um, but he talks about these exponential technologies that are applying to anything that can be digitized. And now biology has been digitized with the sequence of the human genome. And um, there are companies now that uh, sequence the human genome very cheaply. You can get your complete human genome today for $200. And it used to, call, to cost $3 billion. The first human genome cost $3 billion. And it took 13 years. Now, uh, there are several companies. One in the USA, where George Church is involved, and it is called nebula genomics nebula like a nebula from space and there is an italian company which i like also it's called dante dante genomics uh because of dante alighieri uh so uh, who who wrote the divine comedy to go to paradise anyway so dante genomics sequenced the genome and nebula genomics in the usa for only 200 dollars and it doesn't take 13 years it takes just a few days. This is an incredible change in technology. And again, you can see exponential changes, which is what Ray Kurzweil uses. But let me come back to the two years to finish up with these uh, predictions. Uh, he also says, because he's a computer scientist first, uh, that we will also pass the Alan Turing test by 2029. Actually, I think this will happen also sooner. If you have used ChatGPT and uh, other uh, artificial intelligence systems, they interact almost like a human. Anyway, by 2029, okay. if not earlier, we will pass the Alan Turing test. And then by 2045, we will also reach the technological singularity, which means a huge artificial intelligence that will uh, be more intelligent than all of humanity combined, all of us combined. But again, it will also be combined with us. We will be using artificial intelligence for everything, and it will be probably combined directly also to our brains, and we will become more intelligent, not only immortal, but incredibly intelligent. Anyway, so those are the two key numbers and the things you need to look for in this book next year, the singularity is nearer. Uh, Jose, can you ex what is the Alan Turing test? The uh, Alan Turing test was a, a very important British scientist. Um, also, he was a computer scientist, a mathematician, uh, interested um, on the advances on machine learning and machine technology and all of this. He actually uh, deciphered the code during World War II of the German, he cracked the Nazi code so they could actually uh, read the messages that the Nazis, the Germans, were sent uh, via planes, via submarines. So he was a very important scientist. And um, he also said in the 1950s that there could be a time when uh, artificial intelligence would confuse us and we would not know if we are talking to a human or to an artificial intelligence. Um, so this was really incredible and it is called Alan Turing test because he is the one who devised this test. But now that you mentioned Alan Turing, uh, there is also a tragedy in, in his life and, and you can see how primitive we are. We were 
at, at that time as well. A, an incredible scientist that helped Britain and the United States win World War II uh, to defeat the Germans. But, but uh, and, and it is not bad, maybe, and he was homosexual. Homosexuality in Britain at that time was a crime and he was chemically castrated. And after that, he committed suicide. You know, this is so horrible. One of the heroes of uh, World War II who helped to, to discover all the Nazi plans and he was castrated by the British intelligentsia. You know, this, uh, this is unthinkable today, but it helps us to think how primitive, how barbaric we were just over half a century ago. And I want to make another point because by the year 2045, and I think all of us will be alive and should be alive, we will remember how barbaric we are today that we let people die. This is the biggest crime against humanity and we take it as normal, just like killing homosexuals or killing slaves or whatever. You know, that was normal in the past, but it is a crime. We are barbaric. We let people die. So remember in 2045, and also I hope to rewatch this episode uh, with Liz and with Sar, so that we will remember when we were old today, we will be younger in the future and we can see how old we were today. Uh, that's that's true. It'll it'll be amazing. And and I also am shocked by, you know, how the media even tries to control people to make new medicine look like dangerous experimental medicine when people are dying taking the medicine that they're taking. They're still dying of the diseases of aging. So I'm very shocked about that. I wanted to know what is your definition of immortality? Well, that that is an excellent question because uh, immortality, we can never reach immortality because if there is another day, so we still have to be immortal that day and the day after that. So immortality is related to infinite. Uh, actually, this is what they put in the German book cover. They have the infinity sign. But um, first of all, we will probably not be alive for eternity, for infinity. We don't know because it, we might die like the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs died because there was a comet or a big asteroid that hit planet Earth 65 million years ago. So death will always be around. Death is always around. You know, we can die because of an accident, a car crash. We can also die, sadly, because of homicides, which are truly barbaric, or suicides, which I also think are horrible. So those three types of death will probably continue. Accidents, homicides, and suicides. Therefore, we can never say we are immortal, immortal, immortal. And that is why the word amortal, which means no mortal, A in uh, Greek is no, like atom. Atom means no parts, something that has no parts in, in Greek, old Greek. But it's also funny because now today atoms have parts. Atoms have many, many parts besides the protons, the neutrons and the electrons that themselves have many parts below them. So, well, we don't know many things, but uh, yeah, immortality is, is probably uh, hard to know and it will take him eternity to get there. So it might not be the best word. However, I use it because everybody understands immortality. And because in biology, people use it too. They call cancer cells biologically immortal and they call uh, germ cells biologically immortal. So at least in that sense of being biologically immortal, of not aging, uh, we could be immortal. Also, I guess in the future, we will be able to make copies of our brains and of ourselves we can probably read our minds into another substrate and have even more immortality. Not only biological immortality, but computational immortality. This is another possibility. But just to answer your question, yes, uh, we can never say we are going to be immortal. It is more like we are immortal, that we don't want death, uh, certainly not programmed death like all of us are dying now. Right now we are all dying and we need to stop this. 
you know, you watched your father die. That's a common narrative of probably a lot of people watching this, if not their grandparents or great grandparents. There is a lot of uh, shock and terror, I think, in in watching someone that you love die. And I think that it changes us. And And vastly for a lot of the population, I think they want to not consider it. They want to not think about it anymore and pretend that it's not going to happen. But by doing that, you you allow things to get worse and worse and facing it and, and trying to make technology that defeats uh, those diseases for me has been an, a very empowering step in my life. How has it changed how you view your father's death to write this book? Yes, um, what you're saying is so important. We need to change the chip in our mind because since until now, everyone we know has physically died, we think we are also going to die and no one likes to think about death. So we put it back in our minds. We don't want to know about death until it happens. And then, of course, it is too late. So I want to change the chip in the people's minds that we can actually stop death, at least involuntary death. Uh, just like uh, today we fly or today we have telephones. You know, 200 years ago, we didn't have telephones. A hundred years ago, uh, we didn't have uh, rockets uh, to go into space or even commercial um Airlines, they just began about 100 years ago, commercial airlines, um, because flight really began in 1903, 1905. So anyway, um, those things that were impossible to talk long distance, to fly or not to age um, are impossible until they become possible. And this is what I want people to understand. Everything is impossible until it becomes possible. And we are very close to understanding how immortality already occurs in nature. This is not something from Mars or from outer space. No, no, here in our planet, we already have biological immortality. So we need to understand it. And then we need to change our chip because we have even justified death because we had no choice before. And I understand that all philosophies and religions they basically had to justify death because there was no escape to death. And so many religions, they said that there is a second life, that you can reincarnate or you can resurrect. Most Western religions talk about resurrection and most Eastern religions talks about reincarnation. But those were ways to stop us thinking about death here and now. But today, with science and technology, we can stop aging and death. We can put aging behind, like not having telephones or like not having airplanes or like not having artificial intelligence, which will also be normal in two decades. Artificial intelligence will be everywhere, everywhere. Like uh, we can make fire everywhere or we can have electricity basically almost everywhere today well the same would be will be with artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is also incredibly powerful and disruptive technology that is helping us in aging because artificial intelligence and big data are so important to understand how biology works because we have a small limited intelligences but artificial intelligence is helping us to discover the secrets of aging and how to stop aging. So I love artificial intelligence. I think it's one of the greatest technologies. It's a total disruptor. And like all disruptors have good and bad signs, but we should use the good ones uh, like we have done before. Also fire, fire has a bad side. A fire is not just for cooking and warming up. Fire is also for burning people or cities or uh, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy, you can use it for electricity and you can use it for uh, nuclear weapons. 
So all technologies can be used for bad things, but I think humanity is good in general. Most of humans are good and we want the, a good future for us, for our families, for our friends, for our communities, and I would say for the whole planet. Also because in a decade we will have a mission, a colony on Mars, if everything goes according to plans, and that will change our mentality. When we have humans living permanently on Mars or on the moon, we will see how tiny our planet is, how small our planet is, and there are no borders, there are no frontiers. It is one planet for all of us, and the enemy is not us, the enemy is not the climate, the enemy, the enemy is not terrorism, the enemy is aging and death. This is what we have to solve for humanity. The question of ethics and morals of longevity is always uh, touchy for me. Uh, you talked about um, 100 years ago we could not fly and then it became normal. The moment it becomes normal, somebody wants first class, somebody wants business class and somebody is relegated to economic class. Even the economic class, you know, vast majority of the population took another 100 years before they could actually afford flying in even economic class. So what is going to happen with longevity? Is it going to be that, you know, somebody is going to hop onto first class first and the rest of the masses are going to be left behind? Is it not going to have a larger implication on the society at large? Yeah, excellent question. And um, actually, technologies are advancing exponentially and they are also spreading exponentially. Um, if we look at the time it took uh, trains, to go around the planet. Indeed, it took over a century uh, for some countries to have trains that were, you know, developed in the 18th century. Uh, in fact, in some countries still, there are no trains. Not because we need trains, but just as an example. The same with TV. The first televisions, you know, took like uh, over 50 years to get to some countries. Uh, the same when it came in, in black and white first and then in colors. It took many years, but every time it's taking less time, less time, less time. Uh, and I think it's going to be the same uh, with all these uh, biological treatments and therapies. Like I mentioned, the genome, the first sequence of the human genome cost $3 billion and it took 13 years. Now you can do it for $199 in a few days. So this is how it is democratized, when it is mass produced. So I think maybe the first um, uh, therapies will be very expensive, but when they get democratized, they will become cheaper and cheaper. And this will be very fast, an incredibly fast transition. Uh, another example, iPhones. iPhones now come out on the same day all over the world. You know, when the new iPhone comes out, uh, correct me, but I have read in the press that it comes out at the same time in China, in India, and in the USA. Uh, the same with movies, also movies. When some um, big uh, movie like uh, Top Gun, if you have not watched Top Gun, you have to see uh, Tom Cruise because he looks just the same as 40 years ago. Incredible. Tom Cruise, he is using already some rejuvenation therapies. But anyway, uh, the movie comes out at the same time. Also, COVID vaccines, COVID vaccines, you know. COVID vaccines came out almost at the same time all over the world. It is true, again, that it, it took maybe one year for poorer countries in Africa and some places uh, in South Asia. But the vaccines were quickly developed and uh, taking all over the world. And let me continue with the case of COVID because COVID is a small pandemic, very, very small pandemic in global terms in history is nothing, nothing. The Black Plague, the bubonic plague in the 14th century killed a third of all of Europeans. One of every three Europeans was killed by uh, the bubonic plague. That is really a pandemic. Uh, COVID, COVID has killed maybe uh, 10 to 20 million people, which is horrible. It is an absolutely disgraceful thing to happen. But in historical terms, it's a small pandemic. However, it has stopped planet Earth for two years. 
a small pandemic in historic terms stopped the planet. So now that people understand that there is a bigger pandemic that is killing all of us, not a small percentage, all of us, because you, Sart, you, Liz, me, all the people watching this, we are all dying. And not because a small pandemic with a very small probability of dying. We are certain now that 100% of us will die uh, biologically unless we stop it. So this should actually stop the planet, you know. This is what should stop the planet, not COVID. COVID is really very small. So when people understand that aging can be reversed <laughs> and that can be cured, this should uh, be an incredible boom on the economy. So it will be for everybody. And one more thing, uh, how much did people pay for COVID vaccines? People, uh, the customers at the end didn't pay. Nowhere people paid. They were given free. All governments took charge of the cost and gave it free to the citizens. Even though vaccines were not that expensive, you know, the cheapest vaccines were $2, the most expensive about $30, between $2 and $30. Most people in wealthy countries could have paid that out of their own pocket, but they didn't. Why? Because there could have been a revolution, a revolution if they didn't get this treatment as soon as possible and free, free. So imagine when people understand that we are going to have the cure for aging and it is not given free, there would be a revolution. If any president said that someone had to pay even $2, like the COVID vaccine, there could be a revolution. Therefore, my point is that this will be free to everybody. And I want to emphasize free because, of course, it has a huge cost. But that is why Jeff Bezos is putting a, a $3 billion with other people. The government of Saudi Arabia has announced that they're going to put over $1 billion at least for 20 years. And then uh, more governments, more companies, uh, more wealthy people are interested in this. With the goal is that this will be for everybody. So there will be no immortals of first class and immortals of second class. There will be disparities, of course, because some people will still, ha still have more resources, which is understandable. This is how life has always been. But we will always live indefinitely if you want to. Again, this is not mandatory. OK, some people say, oh, but I want to die. First of all, I don't believe that. Or when people say that and when they are close to death, they will probably say, oh, can I have one more day, one more week, one more month, one more year? This is my thinking of this. So, so no one really wants to die, especially when you see that your friends are becoming younger. If you see that your friends, your family are younger, you will certainly not want to die. So uh, one more thing about the ethics, um, because this is such an important uh, topic, uh, Sar. This will be for everybody and it will be free because it will be paid through other sources and uh, through other ways it will be paid right now. 80% of the medical costs in most advanced economies go into the last two years of the life of a person and the person still dies. You know, if the person didn't die, it was okay to put all that money at the end, but the person dies anyway. So this is horrible. So the objective is to put that money not at the end when you die anyway, but at the beginning so that you do not age and therefore will be extra money instead of putting the money at the end and basically having as an expenditure you will save money if you put it at the beginning because people will not age people will not be sick and there will be not such a waste of money this is called the longevity dividend this is a new concept the longevity dividend and the numbers for the longevity dividend are in trillions of dollars per year trillions of dollars if we make people live longer, healthier, we are going to have economic output grow in trillions of dollars, incredible amounts of money just for people being healthy. So this is very important. The money will not be at the end when you die, but at the beginning so that you don't die. This is absolutely insightful uh, thing to listen to. Yeah, I, I have two more major thoughts to share. 
Uh, we live in incredible times. This is the best time to be alive and to remain alive. Because as I mentioned, we are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. This is moving very, very fast, exponentially fast. And in the next two decades, we are going to see more technological advances than in the last two millennia. I repeat, it's incredible. In the next 20 years, more technological advances than in the last 2,000 years. And now we have to focus on the biggest enemy of humanity, which is aging and death. And this is not only a scientific cause. This is an ethical cause, the most noble cause that we can devote our lives to. Because among the list of human rights, the first human right is the right to life. But it should be the second right and the third right and other rights. Because if you are not alive, you don't have any rights. So in the Human Declaration of Human Rights, Right number one is the right to life, but it should be all the rights. We need to be alive and we are very close to fulfill this human right, the first human right and the most ethical thing that anyone can do for humanity, because this is the enemy of all of humanity. It is not the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, the Africans or terrorism or AIDS or malaria. All of those are uh, maybe a problem in some ways for some people at some time, but they are not really the causes of death in the planet. Over two thirds of all the people in the world, even in African countries, poor African countries, is age related diseases. Age related diseases, it was killing all of us. So that is why this is the most moral cause we can have to fight aging, to fight death. And this is what I'm dedicating my life to. And I recommend you to get my book in two weeks, uh, The Death of Death, also in English. And next year, also in uh, Tamil, Indian languages. and uh, Bengali, Hindi, and many other languages in India and in other countries. Jose, where, where can people go to get your book? Well, today, the best way actually normally is Amazon. Amazon is in many countries and it is easy to, to get it. But um, the book will also be, of course, uh, in libraries and in bookshops around the planet. So uh, it is published by very prestigious Springer Nature that also distributes um, in India in English. Uh, but I want to have it in local languages. So sorry, it would be fantastic to have uh, your help on that because we truly live in incredible times. And, and I would like to, to say another thing about the future because the future is going to be so much better than today and so much, much, much better than the past. Even a, a poor person today uh, is wealthier than our ancestors 2,000 years ago and lives longer also. 2,000 years ago, at the time of the Roman Empire, life expectancy average was 20 years. Average life expectancy, 20 years. It took centuries until the year uh, 1900 to almost double to 40. And then again over a century to almost double again to close to 80 years. So uh, we are living longer, healthier, better, more educated. And this is like love. This is like love. You have to tell your loved people, I love you so much more than yesterday, but less than tomorrow. So we are going to go into a better world with more love, with more longevity, with more health, with more intelligence, and with more abundance. And also, we will be leaving our cradle planet to go to other planets. And this is amazing. Once we go on a colony to the moon and to Mars and beyond. That is a beautiful future. And that is certainly a future that I want to join you on. And I'm sure that everyone watching does too. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to link uh, under the video uh, all the ways to get the different versions of Jose's book and how to learn more about Jose Cadero's work and where to find him on his speaking tours. Yes, and if you want to go to space with me, I love Mr. Spock from Star Trek. He always said, live long and prosper. You are such an inspirational talk, uh, Jose. 
I'm sure you will energize the entire planet. Live long and prosper. Thank you.